first move only for girls. So Joel, what is your approach to the animal rights movement? The, the dysfunction of the current industrial orthodoxy is what's fueling the backlash to animal agriculture. If we never, if we had never invented a concentrated animal feeding operation, it could be that the animal, the, the, the anti-livestock movement would not exist. I don't know that because it's hard to you know, say what would have happened. But surely the, surely concentrated animal feeding operations, in my view, are like throwing gasoline on a fire. And so all of the data points that, um, that, that disparage um, animal agriculture are coming from a dysfunctional system. And when they do that, whether it's a documentary like Cowspiracy or the UN Long Shadow Report or, you know, What the Health or you know, any number of things like this, um, you know, I'm sitting there saying, amen, amen, amen. The problem is that the solution is often offered as prohibiting animal agriculture. That's the problem. And so far, uh, I mean, certainly Alan Savory has taken a stab at, you know, through the TED talk about, uh, you know, uh, carbon farming. Uh, there are more and more, in fact, this summer, we are working with three uh, video companies uh, one from the BBC, uh, one from the US, one from France, um, that are all doing in the next 12 months, their production cycle, is to release brand new um, videos showing our side, that, that, uh, that well done animal agriculture can actually heal, heal the planet. And so finally, you know, the pendulum has swung so far, we're starting to see some, you know, some, some creativity in, in painting a different picture uh, with, with pretty pictures of cows in pasture, um, you know, uh, the rhizosphere on perennial uh, prairies, uh, carbon, you know, materials, there, there's some cool stuff. So um, stay tuned. And, and I think that, that our, our tribe, our tribe is going to rise to that occasion over the next 12 to 24 months with a lot of uh, uh, efforts to counter that that pendulum. So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't look. If somebody says I mean, there are kind of two sides to this, one is I don't eat meat because I don't like animals the way animals are treated. That's pretty easy. I can deal with that. What I can't deal with is your cow is my child, is my dog, is my aunt, is my snake, is my uncle. Um, that is not a conversation that we can even have. Uh, so I don't even try to fool with those kind of people. They've got their thing, let them go. They're a minority. Uh, they're not gonna take over the world uh, because their fertility counts are gonna go so low that they won't be able to procreate. So, okay. is it possible to do regenerative agriculture work for dairy? Multi-species pasture cover cropping, grazing, grazing rotations on dairy farms. Oops, this question's coming. From as short as 21 to 60 days, will it work? and still be able to cut the surplus in spring for silage. Diversing, we're still going. Diversifying on farm dairy is already a 24-7 intense job. How can we diversify without increasing our workload? Urea use, a big part of dairy farming in Australia. Thoughts, other options, homemade fertilizers? Yeah, oh, well, dairy, I mean, all I'll say is that the nutritional requirement to finish a beef is exactly the same as to lactate a cow. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the advantage of beef is that the, that the animal puts fat on their back, the dairy farm, the animal puts fat in the bucket. The big difference is that a beef animal can make compensatory gain if they miss a couple of days. A dairy animal doesn't make compensatory gain if they miss a couple of days. So there's no doubt that the dairy is, is more fragile. Um, but, but certainly, there, 
there are plenty of dairy farms around the world that are using these principles. You adapt, you customize, you work with your own personal context. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back with, uh, with, I think, what Charlie said uh, when we talk about the paddock of the mind. These questions, and I'm, I'm being as respectful as I can, but these questions, if you look at all this, these questions right here, um, they indicate a, a must, uh, dubious, I'll just be very, very kind, a, a dubious mindset. And uh, every day people call me on the phone and tell me that what we're doing can't be done. Alan Nation used to tell me, he said, I've learned that if somebody has done it, it can be done. And so um, the key here is the climate of the mind, which is the hardest thing to change, is to come at it um, seeking to learn rather than seeking to fault. And that's all I'll say about it. It's being done. It can be done. And it's a matter of a can-do spirit. Uh, and, and, and my dad used to say, if at first you don't suck a seed, just suck and suck and suck until you do suck a seed. <laughs> um, my short answer to the question would be, you know, the principles apply anywhere. And it's about adapting, not adopting. You know, adapting to your values, your land area, your, your uh, the gear you've got, the pasture you currently have, your production system. Um, adapt it and transition, you know, carve off, if you're spending $500 an acre on inputs, you know, urea and seed and whatever, just carve off $100, 20% and try something different, you know, some of the, you know, a Nutrisoil product or Biodynamics or something and comfortably step into that space. You know, there's nothing, I mean, you can go cold turkey, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, I did, but it was easy because I, I actually just stopped cropping, so I didn't have that. I sort of just took out the whole chemical system cycle. I was stuck in anyway. So, I, transitioning in, 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 in a comfortable um, you know, manner. If I if I were, if I was able to get twenty percent more dry matter out of my grass, would I milk less cows? Uh, the the best way to to uh, make change is incrementally. You know, people love a silver bullet and, and uh, give me the recipe and let me change the batch of cookies. Well, change is not spontaneous. Change, change tends to be incremental and, uh, and we, need, we need to make incremental change, but we can't, we can't run ahead of our confidence level in making change and you can't Google experience. So you have to go incrementally make tests, carve off a little bit, make a test, so that you can make the next step with your own experience, confidence behind you um, enough to make a motion. Can I suggest that don't be afraid of failure? You know, you're not going to get it right the first time, but you're going to learn. Failure is your friend. How do you manage biosecurity um, with visitors coming on the farm and being in all areas of the property? This was just when you talked about your Place to go. Well, we view biosecurity as essentially uh, a breakdown of immunological function. And so we don't think for a minute that anybody's going to bring a disease onto the farm because our animals have an immune system. That's not cavalier. I don't think that's cavalier. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's real. And um, we don't think, I mean, the funniest thing that ever happened to me on biosecurity was three years ago when I was on Kangaroo Island doing seminars, Kangaroo Island, and we had the island's biosecurity ag team out on the field, on the farm, had, had a farm tour. And, um, and so they do this little presentation. We're all standing at the farm gate, you know, the whole, all the attendees, like all of you guys and, you know, and us, and we have to walk through this, you know, this uh, dip thing. Uh, into the gate and there's big brouhaha about you know biosecurity to make sure we don't bring anything in from outside everything's contained on the farm all this stuff and while we're getting the lecture and walking through the dip and getting all of the stuff I'm 
looking over and there's 50 kangaroos jumping over the fence, going through the property, going through here. There's all sorts of birds flying over. They're pooping. They're eating seeds in the neighbor's trees, bringing stuff over. I, 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 just, I just started laughing. And the poor bureaucrats, you know, they were just so serious. They were protecting things. We've we just got to keep this, you know. And meanwhile, the, I mean, the bees and the birds and the kangaroos, and it's just buzzing around and everybody's going from place to place. So I, I tend to think the whole biosecurity thing is essentially if, if your animals have no immune system, then you're susceptible. But if they have an immune system and if they're actually living within a, a soup of microbial and immunological uh, um, acceleration, they'll probably be just fine. Is there a safer alternative to Roundup? There's, there's a product called, um, is it Striker? Or sl Slasher. Slasher. I haven't used it, but that's the one I know that's on, it's probably on a small, small scale. Um, that's the only one I know of that you might compare vaguely. I don't know what the active ingredient is, but it's you know, apparently safe. And I think, like, generally safe. It's not Monsanto safe, it's generally safe. Maybe, maybe the answer is uh, pasture cropping. Paul uses sheep. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, there, there's... Anytime somebody says the only way to... That's a red flag for me. Uh, um, and I find myself, you know, we you get in our silo, right? And we assume, well, the way I'm doing it, this is the way, you know, and, and um, so it takes exposure like this to come together and whatever, hit us upside the head with a two by four sometimes to, to realize, oh, there, there is another way to do stuff. I need it, and I'm assuming most of us need it. Um, Kristen Jones and, Jones and others have done amazing work on um, pasture cropping and uh, multi-species stuff over summer. So in, instead of doing a, a summer chemical fallow and three sprays around up, you know, from December to March, actually using that, um, using that ground to produce something, you may have harvested, but it, you, you, you're, you're increasing biology. You're not actually taking away a moisture, and you're actually um, so when the crop goes in in March, April, the wheat or whatever you're putting in, the, the ground's alive. So there's a lot of science around, um, you know, the stepping into that. You know, well, I don't actually need Roundup now, or I need less of it because I'm I'm actually changing my production system for the better anyway. So it's a, it's a two for you know. Uh, recently, our free-range chicken from Chicken Farm, sorry, was placed on the Aussie Farm website. I told a farmer that I was joining the organisation to their alarm, so I could keep an eye on what their actions are. How would Joel handle the current situation in Australia? This is the uh, livestock terrorist group. Is that what this is about? Yeah, where they like go to farms and. Pick it or there's, a, there's a website that identifies all of the yeah. apparent bad, bad farmers and they can go, oh, I know yeah, you. Yeah. What, what, would I, what would I do? I'd say all publicity is good publicity. <laughs> Come on. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, at our farm, um, half of our interns and apprentices uh, walk around carrying sidearms. Years ago, well, I mean, you know, you've always got a groundhog or a fox or you know something, a bureaucrat or somebody, you know. We don't have that a, a, a couple of years ago, we, we at one of our seminars, we had a couple there that was you know pretty anti-gun, and one of our one of our uh, interns you know, um, carried a, a pistol all the time, and um, and, and they they literally would not, you know, we kind of eat together, mingle, you know, with everybody. And <clears throat> they just kept staying, you know, like as far as I am from, just don't want to get close to that, you know, guns, they, they kill people, you know, and stuff. And toward the end of the two days, you know, kind of their, their trepidation um, diminished a little bit, and they actually got up close enough and they asked him, why do you, why do you carry that pistol in your belt? He said, well, 
because I can't get my AR-15 in my pants. <laughs> What's the difference, this is a big question to throw back at you, what's the difference between organic and regenerative farming? You know, uh, uh, 15 years ago, um, the enemy was Monsanto. And it was easy to have Monsanto as the enemy. They're evil, they're bad people. You know, it was just easy to have that as an enemy. And in the last five to eight years, the enemy has become industrial organics. And it pains me to say it because you know, the foundations of this were a lot of our friends, and, and I know a lot of people in that, and certainly the certification movement, but uh, at least in the U.S., I mean, the, the U.S. leads the world in a lot of things, like, you know, McDonald's and obesity and, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and we now lead the world in the adulteration of organics. And so we're now certifying, for example, uh, soilless organics, I mean, the whole enabling legislation uses the word soil in it several times. And so the fact that you could have organic hydroponics uh, is like, um, you know, an illiterate book reader. You know, it, 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 it's an oxymoron. Um, but but we're, now, we're, now, we're the only country in the world that's certifying uh, hydroponics. Um, you know, organic livestock, uh, it doesn't have to be on pasture at all. Uh, you know, 98% of the organic eggs in the U.S. come from concentrated animal feeding operations, big factory houses, you know, with 20,000 chickens in them uh, that never see the light of day. They're, they're, they're dairies, you know, 10,000 cow organic dairies in the desert on dirt, no pasture, no nothing. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, they just now. They're certifying hydroponic blueberries in pots on land that is kept vegetation-free by glyphosate. And so what we've seen, and, and I, you know, when certification first started 30 years ago, I warned everybody, you know, why, why anybody would give the government which has poo-pooed organics forever and has been our biggest uh, enemy, um, would give them the ownership of the word and the oversight of the use of the word was well, like the fox guarding the hen house. And so, in fact, that's exactly what has happened now over 30 years. We've seen a gradual erosion. There aren't any farmers on the, on the governing boards anymore. They're just industry people. So now it's, it's packed with... You know, uh, uh, you know, White Wave, Driscoll's, you know, all of these outfits is, are, are on the board and it's just, you know, deteriorating very, very rapidly. So that's why suddenly now in the U.S. we have the Real Organic Project. Uh, we have Rodale has another, another one that they're floating. Um, and we now have just, just a bunch of these percolating um, additional certification trials. My sense is, A, anything the government does, they mess up. That's one. So why give them the authority to control it? But number two, you can never have a long-term integrity certification program in which the certifiees are paying for the program. If, if I, as a farmer, have to pay for the certification, for the, for the paperwork and the program, then, the, then the, the, the incentive is to continue eroding the standards to get more people in. It's, it, it's a business just like any other. The only way a certification program can work and maintain integrity is if the final consumer pays an independent certifier to certify farmers at no cost to the farmer, but as a totally independent third party auditor on those farmers with no cost, no paperwork, no nothing on the part of the farmer, all driven by the end consumer back to the farmer. That's the only way I see that you can maintain 
integrity in a certification program. And when you go the other way, the tendency is always to erode them, so we build the brand. We build the organic brand, so we're going to get more and more and more people into it, rather than the consumer saying, here are our values, one, two, three, four, five, this is what matters, and we're going to come in from the backside and certify them as, a, as an end user. I, I didn't say we're organic, I said we're beyond organic. But you use the word, the government owns the word. You know? and, and so anyway, we, we worked through that. Um, but but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't participate in those kinds of shenanigans. A question for the panel. Many speakers talked about working with nature, so why in Australia do we farm sheep and cattle and other introduced livestock instead of kangaroos? I think we need to do both. I think that kangaroos are a natural resource. We have a responsibility to do something about it because we've put, you know, we've, we're growing grass, we're putting water, watering points all over the landscape. We've actually contributed to the population, the overpopulation of kangaroos, so there are solutions. Um, you know, they're a resource that needs to be um, managed. So I think that's a bonus. And the other one, um, the landscape is um, wounded, it's, you know, it needs to be healed, and um, my belief is we're not going to get it back to where it was 230 years ago. We, you know, we can try, we can have some intention to, to shape that, but our Indigenous um, uh, brothers and sisters did a really good job of maintaining that landscape. Anyone who's read Dark Emu or you know, um, uh, The Biggest Estate on Earth um, would know that the state of the, the landscape was like an estate. It was managed, it was, it was amazing, and they were farmers. So a tool we have, um, the sheep and cattle, to, to, to heal the wound, this, this, you know, this wound, this incisions, literal, literal incisions of erosion and, and, and topsoil removal and um, all the, the, the list of, of, of uh, environmental disasters. And they're a tool. So if we choose not to use them, we're probably choosing not to expedite and accelerate the healing of the landscape. So it, for me, it's, it's a question of priority. You know, what's more important? Um, and I, you know, that's what we're doing. We're using them as a tool. And you know, the tool in the in in, in the hands of an incompetent operator can be very dangerous. Um, so again, it's about how you use that tool. Could you please describe how you graze your three species: cattle, sheep, and pigs? Did you transition cold turkey off farm from chemicals? And could you explain more about the cow manure concentrate you make? Okay, I'll make it quick. Thought, yeah, yeah. What was the first one? The grazing. Yeah, so, how do you graze? Well, we graze sheep and cattle, um, managed grazing. So, it's, you know, people, some people call it cell grazing, time control grazing. We call it managed grazing. Um, and we have large numbers of stock um, in, in, in groups. Um, we used to have lots of you know, age groups all separated and so on. So, we put all the mobs together. All the, generally, all the, all the cattle hang out together and all the, all the sheep hang out together. Um, and we split paddocks, um, made them a lot smaller than they were. So we have large mobs in small areas for very short periods of time. And that, um, you know, we have that herd effect that, that Joel was talking about with the bison. Not quite two kilometres, no, 20, 20 miles wide and so on, but the same principle. So that's how we do our sheep and cattle. Um, that's a very short version. The pigs, um, we're running through areas uh, now, we, 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 they were pastured, and they have always been in, on pasture in paddocks, but now we're, we're actually selecting areas in gullies and, and in some of our tree lots and actually um, uh, giving them half an acre and feeding them there for a week and then on rain, when you get the rain, they're digging it up, just other goals um, work at, at, in the States. And then when they're left, we sprinkle a mix of, um, the other day we did radish and oats and vetch and pea. It's amazing. It's amazing what they're doing, expressing their pigness. So that's the pigs. Um, what was that one? Manure. Sheep. Sheep, cattle, pigs, yep. Yeah. Okay, um, sorry, oh, manure. Yeah. Oh, did you get a cold turkey off the chemicals? Yeah, we did, actually. Um, because I, I don't recommend it, by the way. But we were, we, were, we were doing a lot of cropping, but I could... I, um, I just bit the bullet and said I, I didn't, feel, it didn't feel right with what I knew and what I felt and you know, starting a family and 
Um, I couldn't bring myself to keep going out in my, my spray card and spraying you know, when I needed to. So we just immediately stopped our cropping, uh, cropping program. So we basically, um, we didn't even sow pasture, actually. So we saved money by not sowing pasture. And we just let that plant succession take place. Um, I, I, you know, I was not sure about that for some years, but when I look at the pasture now, it's incredible what has been sitting in the ground for 50 years, and we've been flogging it, and then it just goes, oh, thank you. And up it comes, and we've got wonderful biodiversity. So um, uh, you did go cold turkey, stop spraying, and look, we were probably, oh, look, you know, cropping 500 acres. It wasn't massive, but yeah, we just, we just went cold turkey. Again, I, it, it's up to you. I mean, I just didn't want to keep spraying. So, it was another one, was it? Yeah. Well, that's right. We had, that's exactly it. We actually convert. We we we, um, we just use a fire truck, a six hundred litre fire truck with a fire pump and a nozzle. We just get an end cap and you cut a little slot in it, and that's our spray gear. You know, and I sold this crazy rig that I had. Um, and so, yeah, we, we swapped our fertility program. Just went one eighty. You know, we started making. We didn't get bags of stuff in. We started collecting cow shit. It's there in the paddock. We started making our our own brews and wormweed and you know um, seaweed. We make a seaweed brew um, with seaweed powder. Um, roadkill brew. Just get a kangaroo, stick it in a drum, put it in water, put some pre spri by down preparations in. My God, it's like dynamite that stuff. There's your kangaroo problem <coughs> solved right there. <laughs> fish, fish is a bit smellier. And we used to leave, used to do, um, used to electrocute carp in the Lock and River. They still do, and we would leave drums at these fish days. Fish. Fish, um, fishing days for the kids and so on. And um, they got the, the carp, we'd take it home, fill it with water, put the preps in, leave it nowhere near the house. And six months later, it's like, it's like the colour of Joel's um, shirt there. It's this beautiful golden fish for you. For Chris, do you process sheep also? Yeah, the design of the truck uh, was in, in part funded by MLA. Um, so the design scope was that it could do cattle and sheep. Um, on the other end, consumer side, uh, we decided just to go with cattle in the first place. Um, having 90 different products, as opposed to 45, which there is with cattle, um, seemed to be a bit large to do it. But um, I used to do sheep with my other paddock to plate company, so we will do that in time. And what area do you cover? That's a question to you as well. The mobility of the unit um, has a direct relationship to the profitability of the business as well. So um, we've selected um, the Riverina area from Token Mall through to Holbrook and Gundagai is where we're going to start. Some of the rationale behind that is uh, A, the regulators um, are pragmatic here, if not um, encouraging. Uh, when I say here, we're actually in Victoria, aren't we? So New South Wales, um, they're, they're very pragmatic about it. They're just they're the regulations. If you make the regulations, you get your licence, um, which is a bit different in Victoria. Um, so that was one part. Um, access to good quality cattle is, is another and an area that has some resistance to the droughts that come through. Um, and there's the other benefit around here as well is that um, along the, the, the river flats near Tokemore is a very good winter uh, finishing area and then up in the hills uh, around uh, Hogwalk and Gundagai is better for um, in sort of late summer um, into autumn as well. So we need to access stock year round. Um, so we need to have an area that has two sort of peak production areas within about 100 kilometres. So the models are based on um, that the, the truck can move 100 kilometres a day, um, but it'll be doing a lot less than that uh, when we start. We want to farm clean and want to know when it will be safe to run our chickens. We consume the eggs and feed organic feed to our chooks behind the cows to spread the manure. But then the first part is we have vaccinated and drenched our cows. How long before the residue of this will leave our cows and soil? Well, I, I would say our experience has been that if you drench and worm your cattle, there's nothing there for the chickens to be attracted to because it's sterile. We don't want sterile poop. Uh, we want biologically alive poop. And so, uh, so, I, because uh, I mean, we, because we have we have kept neighbors animals before, you know, kind of a custom grazing kind of thing. And whenever they used Ivamec or these kinds of wormers, 
uh, the chickens won't touch the cow patties because there's nothing in there. So, uh, so I'm not sure how to answer the question. I don't know how long it takes for the cow pats to come back for the, to wear off till there's something in the cow pats. Or, Months before you can move it Sorry. 28 days for either nectar and your half life, so you look at it you know, a couple of months before it's worms will even touch it. So, oh. I guess you have to ask the question well, why are you drenching and vaccinating and step back from, from that? You know, if, you're, if, if you've managed grazing, there's going to be a different worm burden or worm um, uh, situation than if you're set stocking. Yeah, I, I can tell you this too. Uh, we have a lot, a heavy tick tick load in our area, and our farm doesn't have any ticks. No, no ticks. Chickens eat them all. So yeah, this this places. whole this whole bird bird thing on the landscape is, um, I, I think, just an, an incredible, incredibly um, underutilized or or. I think we just have not scratch the surface, don't pardon the pun, um, on, on, on getting our birds back on the landscape. I think in ancient landscapes, there were, there were just so many birds. I, I know in Native American lore in the US, Native American lore, there are uh, stories of the bird, well, I told you about Audubon and the flock that came over three days, blocked out the sun. But uh, in Native American lore, there are stories of uh, the bird populations that came through and they would land in the trees and the, the village would wake up in the morning and the trees were just uh, spires of trunks and all the branches were broken off and there were two, uh, it was an inch of manure on the ground. Uh, it's hard for us to appreciate, I think, sometimes the level of, of uh, biological activity that was across the landscape in pre-European days. We've all seen the movie too, you know, so birds, you know, with um, Alfred Hitchcock, we don't. There's a lot of birds in too. So when is, uh, Chris, when is uh, Provenir coming to Western Australia? Personally, we, we get that question a lot, seeing as we um, built the unit over in WA and we actually had the minister uh, sort of spruiking for us to come back from there. Um, for the sort of scale and growth aspirations that Provenir have, um, you know, we're not planning to operate just a single unit. Um, we want to, towards the end of the year, um, do a Series A capital raise, um, and that's going to fund five units, is what our goal is at this stage. And the areas that we're looking at, one of them is southwest Western Australia. There's some really good uh, farmer collectives down there that have sort of come together. They understand the style of um, livestock that they produce there and because um, they're about to shut down the sheep uh, livestock um, export in WA so that's going to be happening so they really need to uh, identify how they're going to diversify and um, branding their product is the way that they want to go and um, probably works pretty well into that. Um, how do you plan to market the meat? Is it by butchers or supermarkets? Like I said before, the, the meat is 52% of the animal. Um, we're, we're in the process of processing, processing whole animals, so um, we have to market and sell uh, the whole animal. So if we're just looking at the meat from there, uh, we're looking at a number of the smaller high-end um, butcheries uh, to have retail-ready packaged um, goods, and also we're looking to um, selling to some of the restaurants as well, so you know, the likes of Neil Perry and Guy Grossi and, and those type of guys who actually have enjoyed on-farm processed meat and know the quality that um, no doubt uh, a fair chunk of you guys have uh, already had that uh, on a regular basis, uh, they're pretty keen to put it on the menu as well. So, And we've also got an online store, so that's part of um, helping the uh, get the product out there that if people aren't close to um, a store that stocks Provenir, they can just order it uh, online and we deliver it through Victoria and New South Wales. Yeah, this is a long one. Very interested in encouraging breed identification for meat consumers. Is this a potential avenue to move away from the standard MSA grading restrictions and opening up a market for beef grass-fed, grown and slaughtered on farm at an older age, as in Europe, to provide a choice of beef intensity flavours through... This person hasn't got any... 
full stops and comments on one sentence. <laughs> Through the growing process, rather than the ageing process, different breeds slaughtered at different ages equals different flavour intensities. Yeah, so we, we, we're talking about the Tawara of beef. That's something that really excites me and I think that's something that we want to provide an opportunity that, to those that are doing heritage breeds to be able to get to the consumer as a product that the consumer understands what they're eating, Belgian Galloways and so forth. Um, and we're very interested also um, in older animals as well, particularly cows. Um, so good condition cows is something that we're seeking. The reason being when we talked to Corey, who's the executive chef at Rockpool, and talked about what we're doing there, and he said, okay, what cattle are you going to have? And I said, oh, you know, the stock standard, yeah. It'll be Angus and Hereford, and they'll be steers and heifers, and they'll be around the sort of 18 month to two year, um, you know, 450 to 500 weight range. And he just said, boring. And I said, you know, really, what, what are you interested in? He said, the flavour is in the age of the animal good condition, older animals um, with the right fat coverage have the flavour profile that we want to serve to our customers. So we actually have to have not only a farm with a story, the animal's got to be a story. So that's part of our value proposition to the farmers is that we want to take a percentage of older animals. We're starting off with cows, not, not bulls because there's other challenges with bulls. Um, and the restaurant industry is very interested in that as well because they want to have the older animals, they want to hang it in their restaurant for another 21 days, um, they want the good fat coverage and the flavour profile in cows is far more developed than in younger animals. you got to remember that you, know, you are familiar with uh, simple and complex sugars, simple and complex sugars. Well, amino acids are the same way. They're, uh, and the older an animal gets, the more complex the amino acids, they start filling in more and more amino acids. And um, uh, that's the whole work that uh, Fred uh, Provenza uh, has worked with, with taste. Uh, that we can actually, so, so the, the richness of taste of an older animal, you know, uh, um, a stewing hen, for example, uh, an older cow, uh, the rich taste of that is the complexity of the amino acids. And so when you, when you talk about uh, taste in product, our love affair with growing faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper, younger, and processing younger and younger and fa faster and faster, the, the blandness, the blandness of our uh, meats and poultry have become actually quite profound. Uh, and, and so this age is a, is a big deal, but it's, it's about the amino acid complex and the age that it takes to finally get all of those fully developed in their amino acid chain within the protein molecule. Uh, one thing that it, it's going to be further down the path that um, I'm very interested in is um, working with a group called Dairy Beef Australia that um, finishes the bobby calves. Um, they can't finish them on 100% grass just because of the nature of the breed of animal they do use. Um, grains and, and do in-field grain assist, so again it's a free range. Um, one of the problems that they've always had is that the fat is yellow and there's this perception in Australia that yellow fat is an old cow and you don't want it, it's something to, you know, poo-poo. Um, the restaurateurs that I have been on my own farm, we process our old um, cattle as well, and they, these are up to like 10 and 12 years old, the, the, the cattle, they get a good run on the farm. Um, and when I show them the, the yellow fat, because they can't get it, they get so excited and they know that when they cook it, you, you can't see the yellowness of the fat, but you can taste the flavour. Um, so there's this big disconnect to what the consumers see as raw meat in the, um, on the shelves of the case, exactly, versus to what you're eating and paying a premium of um, in the top restaurants as well. So I think we've got a role to um, educate and create awareness there. I have a vision, I've had it for some years, being involved in butcher shops um, in various capacities, that the butcher shop of the future will be like a bottle shop, right? You, currently you walk into a bottle shop and you go, I want a Shiraz from the Barossa, <clears throat> I want that year, and you know, I've got my favourite producer maybe, and the butcher shop of the future is going to be the same. You walk in and you go, I want, I want a 
you know, I want a six-year-old cow from Holbrook. Um, I want a short horn, and there's a fellow there I know, and you know, that's what I want. So this is the this is where I, I hope it's going to go. You know, that, that that people are that discerning in the future that that's what they're looking for. I was talking to someone in New Zealand about this. The challenge is that our wine has got a two-week expiry. <laughs> so the other wines, they stay on the shelf, they just increase in value over the yeah. time. So that's, that's the challenge that we have. In, 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 inventory is a real problem there because, uh, because of the wine. But yeah. Here's our seven-year-old uh, Scotch fellow. It's not looking quite as good as it did at the start, <laughs> but it's aged beautifully. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll manage it. We'll sort it out. Absolutely. Um, plug, we... we um, I'll be posting tonight on Instagram a photo of a six-year-old cow that's hanging in Canberra at the moment that is exactly that. Short horn, six-year-old, um, and it's as yellow as the sun. It's, it's amazing. So there you go. Just, just look on Instagram tonight. Go nice. But mostly I just want to say thank you. This is our speakers for the day. How fantastic were they? <laughs>